Happy Thursday and welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Chuck Todd. If it's Thursday, it's the end of a nearly 300-day nightmare for WNBA star Brittany Griner and a rare diplomatic success between the U.S. and Russia as a war rages in Ukraine. The Olympic gold medalist is on her way back to America this afternoon after spending 294 days in Russian prison for bringing cannabis oil into Russia. She's expected to land at a military facility in San Antonio later today. To secure her release, the U.S. agreed to exchange Russian arms dealer Victor Boot, who was among the most wanted men in the world before his 2008 arrest. We'll have more on him in a moment. President Biden celebrated Griner's release at a White House press conference this morning. Moments ago, standing together with her wife, Sherelle, uh, in the Oval Office, I spoke with Brittany Griner. She's safe. She's on a plane. She's on her way home. After months of being unjustly detained in Russia, held under intolerable circumstances, Brittany will soon be back in the arms of her loved ones, and, uh, and she should have been there all along. This is a day we've worked toward for a long time. We never stop pushing for her release. Griner's release comes after she was first detained at a Moscow airport back in February. She was trying to leave the country just before the start of the war. She was sentenced to nine years in a Russian penal colony. Now, the arrest came literally, as I said, days before Russia moved in to invade Ukraine, which then immediately transformed the basketball star into a political pawn in a much bigger global geopolitical conflict. Throughout her imprisonment, the U.S. maintained that Griner was being wrongfully detained and the administration faced intense pressure to bring her back home, along with other Americans wrongly imprisoned in Russia, including businessman and former Marine Paul Whelan. In the wake of Griner's release, some critics are questioning whether the administration was prioritizing Griner's release over Whelan's, who has been detained in Russia since 2018. Brittany Griner's wife, Sherelle, acknowledged the Whelan family's struggle in her remarks today. Today, my family is whole, but as you all are aware, there's so many other families who are not whole. And so BG's not here to say this, but I will gladly speak on her behalf and say that BG and I will remain committed to the work of getting every American home, including Paul, whose family is in our hearts today as we celebrate BG being home. Today is just a happy day for me and my family, so um, I'm going to smile right now. <laughs> In a statement, Paul Whelan's brother David celebrated the release of Griner, but called the news, quote, a catastrophe for Paul. I'm going to talk to David Whelan in just a few minutes. The Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, spoke about the administration's efforts this morning, suggesting that Russia gave the White House no option to secure Whelan's release. This was not a choice of which American to bring home. The choice was one or none. NBC News White House correspondent Mike Memoli has the latest on Griner's release. So, Mike, look, this is a great day for the, for, for the Griner family. But is it also a great day for Russia's uh, policy of kidnapping Americans and using that as leverage to get what they want? It is a great day as well for the White House, but the White House, even more than we saw from Sherelle Griner this morning, is really trying to temper that feeling of relief that Griner's coming home, understanding exactly what you just laid out, which is this larger trend, the larger use by Russia, a state, an entity like that, rather than what we've seen in the past, which is terrorist organizations playing this kind of hostage negotiation game, is a larger concern that I think speaks to the need for a longer-term strategy for trying to deal with this in the future. Because as has been laid out, there are more than just, uh, you know, uh, we've seen Trevor Reed, other uh, Americans wrongfully detained in Russia uh, that there are still need to be brought home as well. And the concern now is what else is Russia going to ask for? And now that the White House has shown a willingness to make these kinds of negotiations, right. uh, what else can be done? And so that, I think, is the larger issue for the, United, uh, for the White House at this point. A clear turning point, Chuck, in this whole discussion was in July when White House officials described that extraordinary offer that was put on the table, which in their view was a two-for-one deal, Victor Boot, uh, for both uh, Whelan mm -hmm. and Brittany Griner. And as this deal came together in the last few weeks, it was only because, as they saw it, the Russians were going to continue to treat the Whelan case 
in very different terms than, than the Griner case. Uh, and so now the hope among White House officials who we've been speaking to today is that this diplomatic channel that was able to successfully navigate yeah. these waters despite the war in Ukraine will continue to be open, will continue to potentially uh, lead to Whelan's return later this year. Uh, but that's a hope more than an expectation, I think. Do you have uh, any sense of why the... Have you gotten any reporting to explain why the Russians are treating Whelan so differently? They seem to value holding him more. Well, of course, the charges against Griner are very different than the charges against Whelan in this case. And that's why you continue to hear White House officials emphasize that they believe those charges against Whelan are completely discredited, not legitimate at all. But that's, it's clear that in Russia's explanation for why they would not make a two-for-one deal here, that they see his case differently because they do, fr frankly, view him as a spy. The United States not willing, of course. They're calling that discredited uh, point. Uh, but I think it's also you know, interesting to hear from White House officials as we talk about this larger trend of Russia playing this hostage game of a political motive here as well. It's, it's been something that the president himself has suggested in public remarks that, for instance, Russia made moves in Ukraine that waited until after the midterm elections. When is this all playing out, Chuck? A day after the Georgia runoff uh, became official. So there's been a suggestion as well on the part of White House officials that Russia and Vladimir Putin specifically is very closely monitoring the political scene here, has wanted to deprive President Biden of anything that could be seen as a political victory. And so as we now move into a potential re-election campaign featuring the former president against the mm -hmm. current president, that's why the window of opportunity here they view as potentially very narrow for securing Whelan's release. So, Mike, so what you're saying is that the White House claims, I'm going to talk to um, uh, John Kirby here in a moment, but the White House believes that somehow, so if, if Warnock had lost, does this not deal happen? I mean, I'm trying to understand that, right, that thinking. I'm simply playing the role that I've played so often here at NBC, <laughs> Chuck, as the Biden whisperer. Right. And I've taken note at the way in which he's raised the connection himself in public remarks mm -hmm. uh, to suggest that this is something he thinks uh, to be the case. Uh, our our mm -hmm. friend there can uh, maybe shed some light on whether that view is shared within the NSC, for instance. Uh, but this is something that I think the president, who has tracked and monitored Putin for a very long time. Yeah. Uh, we've often heard that they understand American politics just as well as we do here. Well, understand, or at least they yeah, certainly follow it. Do. They yep. may think they understand it. Mike Memoli uh, from the White House. Mike, thank you. So let's talk more about how this deal came together, what it means for our relationship with Russia. I'm joined now by the White House's Strategic Communications Coordinator for National Security, and that is John Kirby. Uh, John, it's good to see you. L let me start. Look, this is... Unmitigate. This is great news for the Griner family. This is a relief for the Griner family. But this is a great day for Russia's policy. How do you square it? This is not a new thing for Mr. Putin to do, to, to uh, wrongfully detain Americans and then try to exact some kind of price for it. Sadly, not a new thing for him. Uh, we focused on the deal we could get. Um, and I, I understand the the, the the rhetoric out there. I understand the argument that uh, that you know Mr. Boots a bad guy, and now he's on the street again. I'll tell you this: uh, nobody's doing backflips here, Chuck, about the fact that Mr. Boot is a free man. Um, we're going to continue to make sure we can defend our national security interests, and if Mr. Boot wants to get back into his own line of work, you know, then we're going to do what we have to do to hold him accountable. Um, but it was important as well that we make good our promise to Americans that are wrongfully detail, de detained overseas, mm -hmm. uh, that we're going to get them home. Uh, this was not an easy decision for the president to make. It was a courageous decision, and he believes it was the right thing to do in the end so that Brittany Griner yeah. didn't have to spend yet one more day uh, yeah. in a penal colony for a crime she didn't even commit. Does this mean the American government does negotiate with terrorists? This means that the American government uh, will will make the hard decisions, as difficult as some of them have to be, to, to look after the safety and security of Americans wrongfully detained around the world. What message would it send the world, let alone the American people, uh, if we just let these people languish forever and not make any effort to get them home? I understand that, but the White House has actually actively worked against private citizens uh, in other cases at times, lecturing private citizens and in, in paying ransoms, for instance, to get detained Americans home. Um, it, it, it does feel like there's not a there's not a one poli there's not one policy anymore. 
that you, well, let me, let me just, so try to square that because again I know of and, and you and I May, may know of the same private citizen, but we know of some private citizens that, that try to work around, and the administration doesn't like like it when there's negotiating uh, on that front. But here you were negotiating essentially with a terrorist in Vladimir Putin. We were negotiating with Russian officials uh, for the release of Brittany Griner. We are today, Chuck, negotiating and talking to the Russian uh, and their, those same officials about getting Paul Whelan home, and that's not going to stop. We are doing it in other countries all around the world, as you would expect we would. Uh, and and woe, woe to us if we weren't willing to sit down and have discussions with people with whom we have very significant right. differences, like the Russians, if we weren't looking after uh, uh, American citizens. Now, other uh, there are lots of efforts uh, go on at various levels, not always uh, in the U.S. government to help us do that, uh, but this was a U.S. government deal. No, I understand that, but uh, there's times when the U.S. government frowns upon it when it's done, and here the U.S. government is leaning forward to do it. And, and trust me, if I were that American citizen, I'd want the government to do whatever it took to get me out. Hard stop. But, as you know, how does this not only encourage more kidnappings of prominent Americans if they go overseas. S sadly, kidnappings and wrongful detentions are not something new. Brittany was not the first one, mm -hmm. clearly. Um, and there will be more, sadly, going forward. And what we're trying to do is we've put, it, we've put some additional sanctions in place to, to try to inhibit uh, hostage-taking, as it were. We've also now worked with the State Department to label countries as detention risk. We recommend that if you're going to travel, an American, travel overseas for pleasure or for business, right. that you go to the State Department's website that you look at what the, the designation is for the country that you're going in so that you can go in informed uh, about the potential risk. And if you're wrongfully detained, even if you do everything right, right and you get wrongfully detained, you need to know that the president of the United States, President Biden, is going to do what, what he has to do to try to get you home to your family. And sometimes he's willing to even make very difficult decisions like this one to make it happen. So let's talk about Paul Whelan a minute here, John, because, you know, from the, from, from the outside perspective, it's a head scratcher that a notorious arms dealer wasn't a good enough swap for Paul Whelan as far as the Russians are concerned. Why do you believe the Russian government values Paul Whelan so much? I wish I could get into the, their brains and, and answer that question for you. I'm afraid uh, I don't have uh, the ability to do that. What I can tell you, though, Chuck, is that they view Mr. Whelan very differently, certainly differently than, than Ms. Greiner or, uh, or other uh, wrongfully detained individuals. Uh, they they have uh, levied uh, espionage charges against him, which are, of course, a sham. He's they not think a spy. he's someone they important, believe, and we are we keep telling them he's not. Correct. They uh, well look. I, I think they think that he is in a different category. I'll, I'll let them talk about how important they think he is, but he's certainly in a different category to them than Miss Griner was. And try as we did, and we did try hard to get them both out. Mm -hmm. And we tried various permutations, different offers, different proposals. Uh, I won't go into the details now because we're still negotiating for his release. But we we tried to be flexible. They were inflexible when it came mm -hmm. to Mr. Whalen. Okay, so now we know where we are. Now. We know, yeah. uh, you know, we've done a lot of negotiation with the with the Russians. I think we have a better understanding here, and so we're going to continue to to work other options going forward. Do you buy this uh, Mike Memoli theory here that the that different political moments that you know sort of that Putin doesn't want to ever look like he's helping Biden, but once a certain mile marker is passed, or a poll is passed, or an election is passed, suddenly there's a window of opportunity. Is there something uh, again, to it? Uh, I, I don't think so, Chuck. I, again, we, who knows what Putin's thinking on any given day. Mm -hmm. uh, what I can tell you, as we negotiated this, though, Chuck, um, we didn't pick up any hints or, um, or feigns towards the U.S. domestic political mm -hmm. situation. Uh, that, that wasn't part and parcel of it. So, again, if that was in the back of their minds, I guess I could let them speak to that. Uh, we've been working on this one for months, um, and there was no indication that domestic U.S. politics played a role. John Kirby. Uh, who uh, coordinates communications for all sorts of parts of the national security <laughs> team here at the United States. Your title is extraordinarily long and confusing <laughs> at times. You're John Kirby. It's good to see you. Uh, for good more, teacher. I'm joined now by the executive director of the WNBA Players Association, Terry Jackson. Terry, I just want to start with, uh, share with me some of the relief that you've heard from, from players and from the WNBA community. Yes, it was quite a morning. It has been quite a day, quite a morning. Um, I shared a very succinct, 
simple text in our player leadership um, chat when I knew BG was, was on the plane and truly headed home. And I said, yes, she's coming home. And as you can imagine, instantly um, the response from, from our player leadership, from our members. Um, I think we've got a great post. I've got an incredible intern who put up a great post capturing all those texts, but it's all filled with a lot of emojis, a lot of prayer hands, a lot of beating hearts, a, a lot of relief. Um, it has been 290 plus days of angst, right. um, worrying, advocating, fighting, believing, and here we are. Prayers answered. Um, she's coming home. So let's talk about now an after action report. And it's less about Brittany Griner, but more about the opportunities that professional women's basketball players have and don't have. And the feeling of, well, I, I, I can't make the living playing basketball here in this country, but there are other places to make money. But it's with in not such friendly places. Russia, Turkey, China are three places where there's some opportunities for women's professional players here in America. What obligation do you think the WNBA has to to in, to almost discourage uh, that need for players to feel like they have to go overseas to make a living? That's a question that hits pretty pretty close to home, because as you know, as the executive director of the Women's National Basketball Players Association. I, along with my team, fight for, you know, to make sure that they are properly valued, that they are protected, mm -hmm. that they are supported in their work environment, that they are paid proper salary and wages. That's what our fight was all about when we opted out at the last CBA and fought to negotiate higher salaries amongst a lot of other mm -hmm. changes and improvements. So that's a question that hits very, very close to home, strikes at the heart of who I am as a person, who I am as their executive director, um, and what we do as the Players Association. But you are right. With, with BG coming home, it is now time to have that very fair, that very honest conversation about how you bet on women, mm -hmm. how you invest in them, how you pay them properly, how you um, showcase and broadcast their sport and provide the same opportunities to them mm -hmm. as you have done with men's sports. Now is the time to have that honest conversation, and we will. Would you be open if, if compensation hit a point? Would you be open and if the WNBA said, look, we don't want, if the league said, we don't want our players we don't want them feeling going to China or Russia or Turkey, going to some of these places where, because of their prominence, they could be, you know, uh, targets for kidnappings. But I would assume it's sort of like you you gotta you gotta compensate these folks uh, if you want them to to not pursue those opportunities. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, you know, there's work to be done. There's work to be done, and I think. This has been. Have you heard from league leaders that say that? I mean, it's one thing that the players Sorry. believe this. It's one thing that the mm -hmm. players and you believe that work needs to be done. But does Adam Silver say this? And I throw his name out there. It's like, look, the, the NBA and WNBA joined at the hip. Are, are the folks in the leagues, uh, league offices at the WNBA and the NBA, do they see this? I believe they do. Okay. I mean, I, I think it was a clear message when we opted out, never had done that before. There's work to be done. I think we did good work at the negotiating table to produce the 2020 CBA, and we'll get back to doing that again. Um, absolutely. And my counterpart is Kathy Engelberg. Mm -hmm. She's the commissioner of the WNBA. And so we have a we have a pretty good relationship. We'll mm -hmm. have we'll continue to have these good, honest conversations. This sent a, a message, not just to us, the players, the player side of the house, mm -hmm. but to everybody who is a part of the ecosystem ecosystem for for basketball, for women's basketball yeah. at any level. I think we all would uh, agree that women's uh, basketball players should have better opportunities in America than in Russia financially and that that right there and alone should sort of tell you that maybe maybe we're off on something here terry jackson look you and the wnba players 
made sure this never went away, kept it on the front pages. Kudos to your leadership on that front, by the way. So thank you. You're amazing. Thank you. Coming up, who is Victor Boot? Everything we know about this notorious Russian arms dealer, a.k.a. a nickname, the Merchant of Death. He was the one swapped for Brittany Griner's freedom. Plus, some landmark legislation heads to President Biden's desk after House lawmakers pass protections for same-sex and interracial marriage. We have the latest on that historic vote. You're watching Meet the Press now. This was not a choice of which American to bring home. Sadly, for totally illegitimate reasons, Russia is treating Paul's case differently than Brittany's. And while we have not yet succeeded in securing Paul's release, we are not giving up. We will never give up. Welcome back. More now on the release on WNBA star Brittany Griner from a Russian prison. While the White House was able to secure her freedom, former U.S. Marine Paul Whelan remains detained in Russia, where he is serving out a 16-year sentence after being convicted of espionage charges that he denies and the United States denies. Meanwhile, Russian arms dealer Victor Boot, nicknamed the Merchant of Death, is back in Russia. He was among the most wanted men in the world before he was arrested. The Justice Department described him at the time as an international arms trafficking enemy number one. So joining me now, my, uh, our NBC News colleague, Justice and Intelligence Correspondent Ken Delaney. And Ken, when his name first got put on there, I, I'm sure you, li I, you, like me, heard from a whole bunch of folks in the uh, Justice Department and FBI world that went like, oh, no, not him, please, not him. Tell us about him. Absolutely, Chuck. He's a fascinating character, which is why a movie was made based on his life back in 2005 called Lord of War. Uh, he uh, was in the Soviet Army, grew up in Tajikistan, apparently, kind of a backwater. But he was fluent in six or more languages, which helped him get into the arms business. He started an air uh, transport business, which quickly morphed into an international arms tra trafficking empire. And we're talking about selling arms into the world's most notorious conflicts where there are UN sanctions making those sales illegal. Places like Angola, Liberia, the Congo, in, in a really cynical way. In one case, he was selling weapons to the Angolan dictator and also to the rebels fighting that dictator. And he made a fortune and he came on the radar of US and British intelligence in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, but it wasn't until 2008 when, by some accounts, he was retired. It was harder for him to do arms deals. He was under sanctions by that point. It wasn't until 2008 that the U.S. government concocted a sting operation. The Drug Enforcement Administration lured him to Bangkok, Thailand, and they posed as Colombian rebels. Hmm. And they got him on tape saying that he was going to sell very sophisticated missiles to the Colombian FARC rebels that would allow them to shoot down American helicopters. And then they arrested him in a hotel room, and he's been detained ever since. That was 2008. They extradited him back to the United States, convicted him. He was sentenced to 25 years in prison. Now, he has served, if you count back to 2008, 15 years. So the government, by some accounts, has gotten its pound of flesh out of Victor Booth. There's no allegation that he killed Americans, for example. At the same time, he has deep ties to Russian intelligence, to Vladimir Putin. Right. And there are a lot of people in the national security world very troubled that he is a free man today. Uh, and, and Ken... What do your sources tell, tell you about the Russian obsession with holding Paul Whelan? I mean, the idea that a, the merchant of death wasn't a good enough swap for, I mean, for on their end, if they believe Whelan's a spy, then an arms dealer for a spy seems like a fair trade. I don't get it. It does to you and me, but apparently not to the Russians. Perhaps the Russians want an actual spy. Although there's nobody that comes to mind that would be of equivalent uh, value given the desire to free Paul Whelan on the American side. Um, there was a Russian uh, businessman close to Vladimir Putin charged, uh, extradited from Switzerland back in December and charged with insider trading. And, and we reported that he may have had information about Russian efforts to hack uh, the Democrats in the 2016 election. That could be a valuable person to trade. But what, it's clear that the, the Russians see the whaling case differently, and they decided that this was not an equivalent deal for Victor Boot. All John. right. Ken Delaney and uh, our Justice and Intel correspondent, Ken, thank you. Let me bring in David Whalen. He is the brother to Paul. And of course, Paul remains detained in Russia. David, I know this is, uh, it's got to be a, just an excruciating day. On one hand, it's you, there's some light. OK, that means negotiation is possible. On the other hand, your brother's still there. 
Um, you've heard from a lot of government officials today. It's my understanding that the administration reached out. Are you at all reassured? Well, I think we've always been confident that the Biden administration was trying to do something, and uh, we are confident that they will continue to try to do something. And I think the question we have now is with uh, Konstantin Yaroshenko and Viktor Boot going back to Russia and the U.S. having apparently gone through a list of other uh, concessions that they might have uh, gotten Russia to agree to, and they didn't, um, it's not clear what the U.S. government can provide that will bring Paul home. Do you have a sense, that are, are all your efforts focused on the government representing these efforts, or are you now trying other avenues to get his release, to secure his release? I think if Paul had been a hostage with a terrorist organization, it might make sense to use third-party interlocutors or yeah. um, other uh, other agencies. It's it's the U.S. government, I think, who is our, our primary focus, because they are the ones who can finally make a decision uh, to give the Russian government uh, what they want. And I think that's a huge change with the wrongful detention cases, is that we're now dealing with nation states uh, facing off against each other rather than random terrorist organizations. I, David, you've probably heard me questioning others saying this. From an outsider's perspective, my guess is perhaps yours, no matter, whatever the Russians think your brother was doing uh, there, I, I'm trying to figure out why an arms dealer whose nickname is the Merchant of Death wasn't good enough. Yeah, you know, it's a head-scratcher. I don't know either. And uh, I know that the uh, the Russians are, or I should say the Kremlin, is paranoid about uh, parody. And uh, it may be that now that they have put a label on Paul, I think, as uh, uh, the correspondent who was saying earlier, uh, they called Paul a spy, and they, they will keep him until they have to redeem him for a spy that the U.S. or some other country uh, uh, secures. And and that may happen. I mean, we know that uh, Norway is holding someone who they suspect it to be a Russian spy. We know that Sweden has just arrested a couple mm -hmm. uh, who may be uh, Russian spies. And so it may be that there are Russian spies out there who can be uh, coined and uh, used to bring Paul home. I was just going to say, is that at this point, I, I know all the denials that your family has, all the denials from Paul, all the denials from the U.S. government. But if it if that's what it takes to say, OK, fine, spy for spy, let's go. Do you think the Russian government needs that kind of, as you called it, parody? I do. I think they're uh, schoolyard bullies. Uh, so if you hit them three times, they're going to want to hit you three times. And it really just comes down to numbers. They are only doing exchanges uh, at the Ukraine war, you know, nine for nine. It's just crazy. They're, they're, they're simplistic view of this sort of thing. And I think that that may be what it boils down mm -hmm. to is that um, if, if there's going to be a trade, it has to be something that has the same labels on both sides. Even if, uh, as uh, our family believes, and I think is is, is true, uh, Paul's a tourist and he's not a spy, but it's about the labels and it's about the uh, perception. Um, look, keeping this in the headlines, the, the WNBA players worked, real, you know, kept Brittany Griner, kept this in the headlines. I, I imagine, you know, plenty of us in the reporting world here in Washington have tried to do our best to keep keep attention on this, but I assume that's your biggest fear now, is that suddenly there's less focus and less attention. Not really. I think uh, it is when a wrongful detainee is first uh, taken hostage, uh, that is the family's biggest concern. And I think it's it's one of the challenges when you are first being adv uh, thinking about advocating. Do you even say anything? Do you try to get media attention? And I think in general now, when you're dealing with nation states who are taking hostages, you do want to engage the media immediately so that you can start to get the government machinery working. But I think we now know that all the cogs are spinning at the White House and mm -hmm. in state and uh, so on. And uh, that um, I'm not as concerned as I used to be about media attention dying off, um, so long as I'm confident that the U.S. government is continuing to work. And if, if they aren't, then I think we will do what we can to uh, uh, encourage them uh, with public uh, perception and media to continue to do the work. I know earlier today you had not uh, communicated with your brother, but I thought your, your parents had. What, what is your understanding of his condition and how he's being treated? Well, I think he's doing the best he can. He has uh, come up with a number of survival tactics to get through. He seems to be generally healthy. He gets up every morning and sings the U.S. national anthem, uh, in part, I think, because he's a, a patriot, and in part because he wants to annoy the heck out of the Russian guards. <laughs> and uh, I think he, he has come up with survival techniques to get him through day to day. But a day like today is, is shattering. I mean, it, it shatters yeah. your mental health and your approach. And uh, I think that came through on his phone call to our parents today. David Whalen, um, you know, hang in there. I, I hope uh, the confidence you have in the government uh, is uh, returned. Uh, let's just say, I think we all we all want to see that. David Whalen, thank you very much for your time. Up next, Washington is now one signature away from enshrining marriage equality into 
federal law. Details on today's vote and what happens next after a quick break. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. Turning to Congress, the House of Representatives passed the Respect for Marriage Act this morning. It was a bipartisan vote. 39 Republicans joined all Democrats in a bill that repeals the Defense of Marriage Act and requires the federal government to recognize both same-sex and interracial marriage. The Senate passed the bill earlier in the lame duck session, which means it will now head over to President Biden's desk, where he is eagerly awaiting to sign it. Former Massachusetts House Democrat Barney Frank, who was the first member of Congress to openly come out, was on hand as Democrats celebrated the vote. This is something they've been wanting to pass for quite some time. Additionally, the House passed the National Defense Authorization Act on a bipartisan basis. That now heads over to the Senate, which still needs to do a little bit of horse trading before the U, uh, U.S. defense industry is funded for another year. After the break, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Why the last three weeks have been a tale of two very different political fortunes for President Biden, compared to his 2020 opponent, former President Donald Trump. Panel is next. But first, we've been excited to celebrate 75 years of Meet the Press with clips and highlights from the best archive in television news. Well, given today's historic House vote on marriage equality, let's take a look back on the Supreme Court ruling that made same-sex marriage a constitutional right. Here's a moment from my June 26, 2015 interview with one of the lawyers who successfully argued the case hours after the decision came down. Justice Roberts in his dissent um, on one hand said celebrate uh, he seemed to be happy about the the outcome though upset about the legal justification for the outcome he says you can celebrate every in every every which way but you can't point to the Constitution um, what's your response to that this case is entirely about the Constitution and the great thing about our nation is that we have the courts there to say when laws trespass on basic guarantees and in our nation for over a century marriage has been considered one of those basic cherished liberties and the state needs a very good reason to keep two people out of it welcome back former Mississippi governor Haley Barber used to have a saying in politics, good gets better and bad gets worse. And while the last couple of weeks is any indication since Election Day, well, we've kind of seen that. The good's gotten a bit better for President Biden and the bad's gotten a bit worse for former President Trump. Just the last couple of days, President Biden's Democrats expanded their majority in the Senate in Georgia. Raphael Warnock running a similar, middle, uh, similar playbook uh, against as the president ran in that state as of this morning. Gas prices are down year over year, major priority for the president. The president just accomplished a big foreign policy goal, bringing... Uh, American Brittany Griner home from Russia. As for President Trump, this has been a stinker of a week, uh, as well as the last month, if you will, for his presidential campaign. It began with Republicans criticizing his outlandish and un-American statement about terminating the Constitution for the 2020 election results. Then saw his handpick acolyte Herschel Walker lose handily in the Georgia Senate runoff again. And the week also brought additional legal woes as the company, his company was found guilty in a tax fraud scheme and additional classified documents were discovered in one of his Florida storage units. So joining me now on set, Meredith McGraw, national political correspondent for Politico, former Maryland Democratic Congresswoman, NBC News political analyst Donna Edwards, and Republican strategist Brad Todd. Meredith, I want to start with, with Biden because what I find fascinating about Biden's current state is that his improvement is all here, meaning in Washington. He's got more political capital inside the Democratic Party. He certainly feels as if he's got, it feels like his agenda is right. He told the DNC what the calendar is. You know, he gets to make the weather, if you will. But the American public hasn't rewarded him yet. He's still sitting at the same 40 to 45 percent he's been sitting at since he got inaugurated. That has been pretty remarkable that despite all of these wins that he's had, and especially what we saw in the midterm elections, Democrats were, of course, all surprised by how things went with them there. Mm -hmm. You'd think that you would see a bit of a bump with President Biden, and yet he still has not been able to sell that uh, to the American people so far. As you said, his poll numbers have been pretty stagnant. You know, I don't know, Donna, is this just polarization in the world we live in now? Well, maybe, but I do think that 2023 is going to be an up year for Biden because with a you know deadlock in the House and then um, barely in the Senate. You think having a foil? No, but I think the judges will get through and mm -hmm. ambassadors will get through and appointments will get through and that will keep him on a on a winning streak. It's also true that for you know for Biden, 
um, he'll be able to then start rolling out all of this infrastructure money that's been sitting there, the energy mm -hmm. money that's been sitting there, and it's going to look like one win after another, I think, state by state. You know, it was Trump's trading range was, was always very narrow. Maybe Biden's trading range, if his approval rating is very narrow. Is, is that about the two men, or is this about the current, in your view, the current electorate we live in? I think it's both things. You know, Joe Biden's been around a long time. It's hard to have a new chapter when you've been around as long mm -hmm. as he has. And, and I think one of the what, there, we are in a narrow trading range. In many ways, we haven't moved beyond the Wednesday morning after the 2016 election. You know, the states have basically stayed the same except the ones that were a half. We've point spent apart. 20 billion dollars on campaign ads or so since 2016, and we're we've moved the needle a couple of inches in either direction a few times. And, That's it. You know, we're now down to only five states send a split pair of uh, senators to Washington from about split that? parties, the five lowest states. lowest in the history of our country. Uh, we're down to, I think, 22 seats in the House are different from their vote for president, second lowest in the history of our country. I mean, polarization is real. First off, realignment was real, right? Mm -hmm. This is not the alignment we had mm -hmm. for four decades, and but we have realigned, and it is... We are now fighting over inches for everything. All right, let me move to Trump and the Republicans. Uh, besides Herschel Walker, who else owns the loss on Herschel Walker? Brad, I'll start with you. Uh, I think the Republican Party owns it on the donor side. You know, I mean, Herschel Walker raised more money than any of the next three Republican candidates for Senate in open seats. you got to give him credit for that. It's one of the top five or six most fundraising successes for a Republican Senate candidate ever. However, Raphael Warnock raised more than twice as much. Our donors have not accepted the fact that we're now in a world where these Senate races are going to cost multiples of what they did four or five years ago because we're there are so few people up for grabs. So you think this is a winnable race still? Absolutely. That Herschel Walker isn't the reason they it, lost. It's a, it was, it, it, Georgia's a winnable state for Republicans won more votes in the, in the congressional races mm -hmm. in Georgia. It's a, it was a winnable, winnable state, but you can't leave your candidate with half as much money as his opponent does. And that's what our donors did. Meredith, do you think if there was financial parity, Walker wins? Um, I mean, I think the, the fact that Warnock outraised him by so much was pretty remarkable. But one thing that I reported on um, was the fact that Republicans are, are really coming to terms with the fact that they were not pushing the same kind of early voting that Warnock and the Democrats really capitalized on um, in this runoff election. And part of that, of course, has to do with the former president, who has balked at mail-in voting, who's made his supporters believe that it leads to widespread fraud. And I think there's going to be a lot of soul-searching there um, for the Republican Party and, and how they sort of re-educate and deal with uh, voters on, on that I, I front. I think that's true. I mean, Republicans have good reasons to, to, to not want a lot of early voting, especially mail voting. But early voting in person, especially under Georgia's new law, is very secure. Mm -hmm. And Republican voters need to take advantage of it. And I think we have to reorient our turnout preparation that way. You know, Florida's a state where Republicans do vote early. Uh, and you saw it was a pretty good night for Republicans there. North Carolina this year had more Republicans vote early than ever before. It was a pretty good night for Republicans in North Carolina. All right. But aren't we dancing around that? I mean, Donna, <laughs> is, this thing, is it really tactics and money? Or is it Donald Trump and Herschel Walker? Well, I, th I mean, look, almost all of the candidates that Donald Trump endorsed, at least in the, in the statewide races, the Senate races, they lost. Um, but they lost um, in most instances in very narrow, uh, very narrow margins. And what that means is that Democrats have to be prepared to contest every single seat because they are going to these races are going to be decided mm -hmm. um, very by really slim margins. And I don't think that we can just celebrate the fact that Democrats won. Um, precisely because it was a narrow victory. If it had been larger, we'd be celebrating, but I don't think we can do that now. Is a Trump endorsement valuable to a Republican in a swing state? Well, if it gets you through the primary and you don't make it through the primary otherwise, then yes, it would be But if be you valuable. can't win a general... <laughs> but it's a... Uh, but if you can't win a general, what's it worth? Well, Ted Budd won a general with his endorsement. And so yeah, I, think, I, think, I think the question you, you have to... Well, it's still a pretty narrow state, though. Mm -hmm. I, 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 you have to win the election that's in front of you. And if you have a contested primary, you have to win that primary. Now, you can ask yourself whether we need fewer contested primaries. <laughs> that's pretty hard to police on the Republican side. But Democrats generally have not had primaries in the last two or three cycles in Senate races. Republicans have. It, and it's it, hurt us. It's it, hurt us to have It's it. obvious, Meredith, right? When so, Democrats have primaries, they have progressive problems. When Republicans have primaries, they have 
Trump right problems. Yeah, and Republicans really do have Trump right problems. I mm -hmm. think that's been made pretty clear from the get-go. Um, in talking to Republicans, I'm sure a lot of them would have preferred to see uh, Dave McCormick maybe on the, the ticket instead of... Uh, Dave McCormick wins. Yeah, but I've listened to a wins. lot of Republicans, um, you know, especially Senate Republicans, complaining about the, you know, the candidates and saying that Donald Trump is, you know, interfering. At the same time, you, those are the candidates who are able to get through these primaries. And until Republicans figure out that problem, mm -hmm. I think Democrats are going to be in the catbird seat with candidates who are able to travel through the middle. Can Trump recover inside the Republican Party? And if so, how does that look? What does that look like? Well, it, it, would, be a, it would be a very diverse field. It would be a wide, vote, wide field with a splintered vote, mm -hmm. uh, I think. You know, our rules favor someone winning with a plurality. Uh, we have a lot of states that are winner-take-all. We have a lot of other states that are winner-take-all by congressional districts. And so if you have four or five candidates, 30 percent is pretty hard to stop. Uh, that's how he got the nomination in 2016. That's what he's hoping for this time. A lot of other Republicans are hoping for a condensed field, mm -hmm. like maybe two and a half candidates total. You mm -hmm. know, so somebody, maybe someone early to spar with right. for the next six months and then somebody else who, who comes in with... It's funny you later. say that. I have a, I, I have a sneaky suspicion we're not going to see a lot of announced candidates before the 4th of July, Meredith. I think a lot of them are going to be holding off. I don't think Maybe even, too. you know, conversations are going to be starting until the new year. Um, if you're DeSantis, you want to wait to get through, you know, the start of legislation. I don't know why DeSantis you know. would announce before Labor Day. Yeah. At this point. Yeah. Considering his standing. I and, would I just wouldn't make any sense. And I think for a lot of them, too, you know, we've seen over the past three weeks how Trump has um, it's sort of been death by a thousand uh, paper cuts with a lot of self-inflicted wounds here. And I think a lot of them are waiting to see just uh, how much further things will go. Yeah, but there doesn't seem to be much separation. Er, look, in Washington, there is separation, increasing separation from Trump. Mm -hmm. But on that base, I mean, you just look mm -hmm. at the vote in, in Georgia, his base mm -hmm. is still with him. Still and that's, there, a, yeah. that's a good 30 percent. They're not going. Anyway. We also have to spend some time figuring out what we're going to say. Uh, I think one problem in this election is Republicans didn't have a coherent agenda that we ran on other than not Biden, not Democrats. Right. Republicans have to be for some things. That may mean taking some chances. You know, it's conventional wisdom in Washington. Don't say anything if you think it's a good year. That's that doesn't work in the Internet era. You have We've, to have a message. Like everybody needs to learn that. Hillary Clinton learned that the hard way in 16. I mean, her message was just simply not Trump. Uh, and then I, I want to sh show something else here about this independent problem. Maricopa County put out its uh, final registration numbers uh, in Arizona. And just to show you the power of the independent vote in Arizona, Republicans had a nine-point advantage on party registration in Maricopa County going into the election. 41% registered Republican, 32% Democrat. Yet, look at this. Go and the, the Democrat carried uh, one, one Maricopa by two. Kelly won it by six. Secretary of State by eight. Only the state treasurer was able to carry Maricopa County. Uh, that means independence swung 20 to 30 points towards Trump won the Democrats. Maricopa County in 2016, too. Yeah. You've got to remember. I mean, it, 16, but not in 20. Not in 20. It's the largest county, I think, in the country it carried yep. in 2016. And didn't lose about much in, in, in 2020. But isn't this the, isn't this the, can, like, hey, he's toxic to independent voters. The Trump brand is toxic to independents. In some places, he has a, he's yeah. a real problem with independent voters, for sure, in the West in particular. Yeah. Donna. Well, and in some of these places, especially when you get out into the suburbs where you've got these swing uh, congressional districts, these are these independent voters are not going for crazy, and they mm -hmm. prove that in this election. No, it is pretty clear. We may be at 45-45, but the 10 percent that sits in, in Arizona and Georgia, my God, are they powerful voters <laughs> these days. Anyway, Meredith, Donna, and Brad, thank you all. Still to come, winter warfare, prisoner swaps, and Putin's new warning. The former ambassador to Ukraine, Bill Taylor, joins me on set to discuss everything that we've learned today about Russia, as well as what's going on in the war. You're watching Meet the Press now. The Russians speak the truth. Welcome back. On the same day the U.S. completed a prisoner swap with Russia, Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peskov is now saying that Russia has no plans to seize additional territory from Ukraine. That's according to Reuters. This comes a day after Putin acknowledged that the fight in Ukraine is taking longer than expected. Meanwhile, Russia's battlefield strategy is now looking to weaponize winter by targeting Ukraine's energy grid. In a Washington Post op-ed this week, Bill Taylor, the former U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, and David Kramer, a former assistant secretary of state, write that the West should do whatever it takes to help Ukrainians survive the winter. And Ambassador Taylor joins me now. So, Bill, what do you take away from the Russians' willingness to do this prisoner swap on Brittany Griner? Now, we can discuss sort of why they value Paul Whelan more these days than, than Brittany Griner. Um, but they wanted, they wanted to keep that channel open. Why and what does this mean for the war? 
Chuck, I think this means <clears throat> that they, the Russians realize they're in trouble. Mm -hmm. So they're looking for something to both change the subject, mm -hmm. but they may be looking for some way to think that if, if they can negotiate with here, maybe they can negotiate with here mm -hmm. on, on Ukraine. They're not, the, the Americans and the Ukrainians are not buying it. Mm -hmm. the Ukrainians continue to push um, on the battlefield um, and, and they continue to push the Russians back. And so far, the Biden administration has not been willing to get involved in that, in that negotiation. That I believe. But what about Macron? What about the rest of Europe when they see Peskov saying, hey, we're done. We don't want we're, we're, we, we, whatever we got, which means they realize every day that this goes on, they could actually lose gains that they've made. I actually don't believe the Biden administration wants to negotiate yet, but I do think Macron does. Macron does want to somehow be in the middle of things. Yeah. And that's a real mistake. And I think a lot of people are telling him this is a mistake. I know the Americans are, must, they must be telling him it's a mistake because exactly what you said. The Ukrainians are pushing the Russians back. The Russians say, we'd like to stay where we are. We'd like mm -hmm. a ceasefire right in place so that we can keep what we've got. And then, you know, we'll, and Macron sounds like he's willing to talk about that. The Ukrainians are not. And obviously, the more Macron does that, the more Putin wants to engage that, right? Putin knows he's in trouble. Mm -hmm. He knows he's in trouble um, with allies. He knows he's in trouble with the Chinese. He knows he's in trouble both the right and the left in Russia. He knows he's in trouble on the battlefield. The only thing he's got are these bombs against the Ukrainian mm -hmm. civilian targets. That's the only thing it's working for. Let's talk about the winter here. Obviously, I think the Ukrainians think they can sort of do, do to the Russians what the, Russian, what, the, what the old Soviets did to the Germans in World War II. I, that seems to be the strategy, right? They're hoping that they can essentially withstand winter better than those visiting Russian soldiers. And they probably can. Mm -hmm. They probably can. The, the, the Ukrainian soldiers are in better shape. They are, they're better equipped. They've got better warm weather gear mm -hmm. um, than the Russians do. Um, I worry about Ukrainian civilians, mm -hmm. and that's what Putin's after. He wants to try to break the Ukrainian civilians so that they'll give up um, or press on President Zelensky, and they're not doing Yeah, that it. feels like that ship has sailed. That at this point, everything that the Ukraine, an average Ukrainian has sacrificed, at this point, they're like, well, uh, I'm in for a dime, in for a dollar. Right? In for a dollar, exactly mm -hmm. right. And it makes them angrier. Right. It makes them more determined to beat them. So the Ukrainians, uh, the civilians are right with, right with the Ukrainian military. Solid. Um, last week, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu was on this program, and he sort of pitched himself as a mediator. In fact, claimed others were reaching out to him to be a mediator between Zelensky and Putin. Um, not surprising that he's going to boast of his own ability to do this. But does that actually make some sense? I'm not sure it does. Okay. Um, I'm not sure it does. The Israelis and Mr. Netanyahu have not indicated that they are even-handed. They're not support. They're not providing the kind of support that you would think um, would would come to Ukrainians. Well, no, and, but doesn't that mean he would he would actually have more of an open uh, open door to Putin if the Ukrainians will listen to him? And it's not true that the Ukrainians. The key because we the would Ukrainians. trust Netanyahu is a strong word. But the Americans would certainly feel as if they could have leverage over Netanyahu. I suppose, although... Well, you're really skeptical is, of this. I'm skeptical would of Would you take Netanyahu. Erdogan over Bibi? I, I, you know, Erdogan, at least, yeah. does have a track record. You yes, know, he does. That's a grain deal. That's right. With the UN. Mm -hmm. The UN. Guterres was there as right. well. Um, but uh, so, so Erdogan, Erdogan has something to be able to point to. Netanyahu doesn't. What's your sense in this lame duck about the... Doing a Ukraine aid deal now before Republican politics scrambles things a bit in the House next year. It's a bit. I think that's right. It'll scramble it a bit. I don't think it will scramble it in a major no, way. No, it could, but it could create hiccups, there slow down money, hiccups. slow down there, weapons. There right? are a couple of different voices right. in the Congress, in particular on the House side. Um, but overwhelmingly, up until now, with mm -hmm. these current members of Congress, it's been overwhelming support. That doesn't change. That didn't change very much. The voices are... Yeah. are uh, How's Zelensky dealing with uh, a little more domestic criticism, right? It just comes with the territory. Comes with the territory, but I saw a poll two nights ago that yeah. showed the, the Ukrainian support is increased for, for Zelensky. Yeah. 
is increasing now increasing, again. It's, increasing okay. again. it's well into the 80s, well into the upper 80s. Because there was some, you, you started to hear at least some other politicians starting to... Of course you yeah. do. Of course you do. Right. All right. Bill Taylor, always good to see you. Chuck, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for being with us this hour. We'll be back tomorrow with more Meet the Press Now. NBC News Now coverage continues with Hallie Jackson right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.